engagement. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <laughs> I think we should start. It's 10 o'clock, so um, we have one hour for this session. So uh, let's get going. Okay, most welcome everybody. Let me uh, very briefly introduce myself. My name is Roland Stekelenburg and I'm head of new media at uh, NOS. And NOS is the Dutch public broadcasting system. And within that system, NOS is responsible for news and sports content. Uh, we have a very uh, um, substantial mobile presence. We developed a lot of different applications and websites. Uh, here you see an example of what we do uh, on Symbian and Windows mobile handsets. Uh, before we start, I would like this session to be as interactive as possible, uh, meaning that anybody who has a question wants to interrupt one of the speakers because you think we are talking nonsense, please <laughs> do so. Uh, this is supposed to be interactive, so don't hesitate, grab the microphone, and we are very interested in your contributions anyway. But before I introduce our guests, uh, I would like to do a quick survey in the audience. Um, if you carry w more than one mobile phone, could you please raise your hand? <laughs> okay, that's substantial. Who carries an iPhone? Blackberry. Nokia. We. Oui. Very small amount of people. Windows Mobile. Three people. Android. <laughs> That's amazing me. Huh? Don't be don't be shy. Don't be shy. Who has a company phone? Okay, so most people have a private phone. Who has used mobile internet this morning? <laughs> Almost everybody. Who has watched a video this morning on his mobile? Who has an augmented, augmented reality browser installed on his telephone? Five people. Okay, that's interesting. Anyway, let me introduce our, our, uh, let me introduce our guests this morning. Stacy, can you please introduce yourself? Good morning, I'm Stacy Kramer. I'm co-editor and executive vice president of Context, Content Next Media, which most of you probably just think of as paidcontent.org. Uh, we're also mocoNews.net, which covers the mobile content world, uh, Content Sutra, which covers the digital uh, media economy of India, and Paid Content UK. Um, and I should add that for the last year, we've been a wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian News and Media. Um, but we are operated independently editorially, um, although we do enjoy working with our colleagues at Guardian. Uh, and I will also say, the reason I haven't watched mobile video yet this morning is I just can't do it before 10. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on your website you say you are unhealthy obsessed with mobile content. Why is that? <laughs> well, several years ago, um, when, when our founder, Rafat Ali, uh, realized that mobile content was beginning to pop, you know, to be more and more important, um, we really did become obsessed with it. We wanted people to know what was going on in mobile content, not just the, you know, not just the content of it, not just the editorial, but the, the business models behind it, the advertising, the payment systems, how is this going to work? I think um, we were very f ahead of the time when it came to that, you know, focusing in on that subject. And we've been able to watch the growth of the industry um, and the way that it's changed. I will also say that I was a long time Windows mobile user. Um, the HTC, through a series of HTCs, what happened was my carrier missed a cycle on the HTC and didn't have a phone that met my needs. So I actually think I gave up a lot to go to iPhone. Um, I gave up the ability to use Skyfire, which I think is one of the greatest uh, part. And I, I don't know anyone there, so I'm not giving them a plug in that regard. But I gave up the opportunity to do a lot of things outside the wall of Apple. Okay. Thank you. Uh, second guest, Benjamin, could you also please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Benjamin Moss, Director of Mobile at the Associated Press. Um, uh, our group uh, is really tasked with mobilizing the Associated Press assets, and most recently we launched AP Stylebook on the iPhone. Um, but what we're most known for is an initiative called AP Mobile, which is a... So what we're, uh, is that better? No. Um, 
what we're most known for is AP Mobile, which is a, uh, it's a mobile property, essentially. Uh, we're on all of the major uh, platforms, uh, BlackBerry, Nokia, iPhone, Android, Palm, Windows Mobile, uh, and we also have uh, mobile internet sites. Uh, and what AP Mobile is, is it's a collection of national and international news from the Associated Press combined with aggregated local content from uh, what the Associated Press calls a digital cooperative. It's a, a membership of uh, 1,200 newspapers here in the U.S. Um, that, that uh, essentially provide uh, local news and, and local community to, uh, to mobile users. We're also expanding internationally. We've just announced a, a partnership with the Canadian Press. Uh, and there is uh, there are more uh, international expansions to come. Um, okay, I, I was wondering that AP Mobile aren't you competing with your own customers? Uh, it, 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 oh, we we like to think not. Um, the, the <laughs> and and I'll tell you why. The the mobile ecosystem is a, a little different uh, on a number of fronts. The carriers uh, the carriers are the ones who really control eyeballs here, at least in the U.S. Um, and we see, uh, um, we see that in aggregated play, where the members own the, the, the initiative, so the members are actually the ones who started this initiative, um, is the best way and the fastest way for, for users to get access to content. Uh, I don't have to remind you that it's very, very costly to provide not only mobile internet versions of your websites, of, of, of newspaper websites, but then to do that on, on multiple platforms, six platforms, seven platforms, and there's only more to come, uh, is, is time consuming and, and very costly. So aggregated play, leveraging investments centrally, uh, and making sure that, that uh, newspapers uh, get a higher return on any advertising uh, revenue that they would, than they would with any other uh, type of platform. Okay, is it profitable? The AP Mobile, by now, uh, it it uh, not profitable yet, but but you know it will become very soon. Okay, uh, and I want to say we're not we don't compete with mobile internet websites or mobile applications. In fact, we we uh, our strategy is that you know we we like a, a very full ecosystem, uh, and we you know we absolutely commend people who create and put their investments into mobile mobile applications. Okay, thanks. Uh, the third guest is uh, Gunnar Garfors. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, Gunnar Garfors. I'm heading Norwegian Mobile TV Corporation, which is being owned by the three biggest broadcasters uh, of Norway, uh, Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation, TV2, and Viasat. I'm also head of mobile distribution in one of the owners, NRK, Norwegian Broadcasting. Uh, I'm heading IDAG, Inter International DMB Advancement Group, which works with mobile TV across the world and the DMB technology, and I'm also uh, Vice Chairman of the EBU, European Broadcasting Union's mobile group. Um, just a, a few notes, I'm working with mobile um, since 2001, when we launched mo the first um, mobile internet site in Norway, and in 2005 we were the first in the world to launch live mobile television via 2.5G uh, uh, networks. So I've been doing this for, for a little while. All right, you are vice president of the EBU mobile group. I've noticed that this is probably the only sessions with uh, Europeans on stage. Uh, is Europe ahead as far as mobile is concerned, uh, if you look at the, the different continents? Uh, Asia and Europe have done a lot of exi exciting uh, stuff there. Um, Asia is in heading in some way, especially Japan, because they have... Um, well, so the, the rental prices there are too high, so people don't have actually room for a laptop or a computer in their homes. So they're doing everything on the mobile. But except for Asia, Europe is, is quite advanced when it comes to mobile. I'll definitely say that, yes. Okay, what is the reason for that? I think because uh, we have, uh, well, if, to speak about Norway, we have loads of uh, rural uh, small villages and towns. We've always been obsessed by mobile or phones in order to get uh, keep in touch with each other. Um, and we're very advanced when it comes to new technology and gadgets. We're gadget freaks, I suppose. Okay. I'd like to break in, though. Even though I'm Irish, I'm going to say in the US we're seeing a huge amount of um, innovation around mobile advertising. And I think that's where the, the next wave of monetization and, and revenue opportunities are going to come from. Okay. If, if we talk about uh, uh, mobile content, normally we start talking immediately about mobile phones. 
uh, uh, Stacy, there's more th to mobile than phones, isn't it? Well, there is. Um, and, and I actually sort of brought some, a little show and tell here. Um, this is a Kindle Generation 2. Most of you have, uh, has, has everyone tried one? Or how many of you have tried one? How many of you own one? How many own a Gen 1? <laughs> Anybody own a DX? Yeah, we're all journalists. We can't afford DX. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Anybody has a Sony e-reader? Anybody has yeah, any other kind of e-reader? Mm. No. And how many are planning to buy an e-reader, standalone e-reader, in the next year? We're just waiting for it to shake out. Okay. You want color. But what is your point about the e-readers? Well, what I, wanted, what I wanted to say is, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways that people are, are accessing mobile. And I didn't bring this one for show and tell, but the Zune HD just came out with a browser, a full mobile browser. And, you know, to keep in mind that mobile is not just handsets. And mobile, and even within, within handsets, not all handsets are created equal. And you can't do the same things for each one. Now, that's one of the barriers that we all have to creating content. It's difficult to create content that can be read across multiple devices and multiple platforms. But it's really important, and particularly as things like the netbook um, take off, you know, when I look at this screen, which is not a netbook, it's right above one, when I look at this screen, it's usually designed for people with larger screens. And things go off the page. I don't see them. It's, it's a usability issue. But it's also a reach issue. You can now reach people in places through mobile devices that you could never reach them before. And if, if you can find a way to grab their attention, you know, that's, that's when you have the best chance of keeping their attention. Okay, but, but uh, um, the problem is, of course, those devices are Wi-Fi based and, uh, you know, there's still very limited availability of Wi-Fi. Gunnar, uh, you were also looking at uh, reacting. What, what's your reaction to the point? Well, we uh, launched uh, television for portable devices in May via DMB, a broadcasting technology, and we decided to call that Mini TV because we wanted to distance us from the mobile phone. And of course, if we look to the mobile network operators, they want to act as a gatekeeper to control the content that the users uh, access. And of course, they only want this to be available on mobile phones. So we said, OK, we're going to call this a mini TV. It's going to work on PCs. It's going to work on multimedia players, on mobile phones, of course, as well, and on any device with a uh, screen. And that's, that's portable. So that was a, a quite an important distinction for us. And, and that applies to television. It applies to different, uh, all kinds of, of distribution technologies, really. And we also have to think about you know, mobile devices in cars, GPS uh, machines. All of these are going to be, they're all already mobile. Um, and they're good places to distribute content, too. So basically, focusing on the phone is risky. I mean, there are many more devices that, that are mobile and that we should take into account. Focusing on the phone and getting it right is important. Um, but remembering that there are a lot of other ways that people come into the mobile universe is very important as well. And I would add that, why, you know, that a number of the things I'm talking about do work on 3G mm. or do get content. You know, I mean, I get this content through Sprint. Um, you know, our iPhones or various other phones may go back and forth between cell networks and Wi-Fi. And one of the most interesting things that's happened in the last few months is the amount of free Wi-Fi access that's expanded in the U.S. So with Barnes & Noble opening up their networks so that you no longer have to pay when you come in, with Starbucks opening up its networks, the ability now to reach Wi-Fi access is, is I think, much greater than it has been, ben, wouldn't you say, in, in years? Uh, Ever. Sometimes, Ever. you know, in, I, I live and work in New York, uh, sometimes cell uh, reception in New York is a little less prominent than Wi-Fi coverage. Uh, on my AT&T iPhone, I had a lot of problems actually <laughs> getting access to data. Okay, they, they, uh, let's go to another subject. I call this session the uh, journalism for and, and from the mobile generation. Uh, but my question is, is there a mobile generation, Benjamin? Uh, and if, if there is a mobile generation, what does it look like? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, you know, your typical response is, yes, of course there is. They're young. Uh, from our perspective, uh, from everything we've seen on, on AP Mobile, we obviously skew a little older. It's a news demographic. Uh, I, you know, with pen penetration here in the U.S. reaching over 83% of all uh, of all of the population having mobile phones. <sighs> There's no such thing as a mobile generation. I think everybody is mobile. Um, it's just a matter of, of changing usage patterns. And there, there we can really talk about, um, you know, 
new new ways of usage. Okay, yeah. in, in Holland, for example, the mobile phone penetration is, I think, 107%. So uh, there are more phones <laughs> than people. Uh, but only 15% of, of those people use actually uh, internet on the mobile. How, how is that uh, a metric? Uh, are they different in the United States? Yeah, well, it, it, just by a couple of percentage points. I think we're up to about 17%. Is that the latest, something like that, in terms of in, in data usage? Okay. But again, mobile is not, the mobile generation is not only using the mobile phone, this is all about freedom of choice. And we see that I might want to read something, read a book on, on this one, or watch TV while I'm actually texting or speaking on the phone. So a lot of people, they want different devices. They don't want everything in the same device. Whereas other people do, of course. But that yep. should be up to the user. It should not be up to their operator or to um, the service provider. You know, I, I think when I first looked at the topic of the panel and I thought about mobile generation, once again I was hearing about the native, the native internet generation or the native users, the people who've never gotten information or news any other way. But really what we're doing is creating new waves of mobile generation here. Um, we're seeing people who are in their 30s, their 40s, their 50s and older relying completely or almost completely on mobile devices for their major news. Um, and that, or to get them, you know, to tell them it's time to go turn on the TV and watch this. It's time to go pick up a magazine or a newspaper to read this. Um, we, we run the risk if we only think that mobile generation means younger of missing a whole lot of, of users. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's a, a lot of discussion in, in the newsrooms and uh, uh, especially amongst uh, the managers about made for mobile content. You know, uh, we have all those, this content available. It's, it's, it's normally it's also available on the web. Uh, uh, is it important to, to make special con uh, uh, content for the mobile phone? What, what is your opinion on it, ben, uh, Benjamin? Um, uh, I think the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to give you some examples of what AP is doing uh, on the kind of AP mobile platform. Uh, we have a, a, a desk of, of editors who, on a 24-7 basis, are, are ranking headlines specifically for mobile. Uh, we recognize that, you know, when you're on a mobile device, that what's important to you is very different from when, when you're on a desktop. So we make sure we bubble up to the, the surface, you know, what's going to be really important uh, in terms of like breaking up to date news. Um, we're we're kind of looking into rewriting headlines for mobile, making sure that, that you know, we already have uh, a mobile headline uh, series, um, but we're looking at even fine-tuning that uh, beyond what we currently do. Uh, photo selection. But what, what do you mean by fine-tuning? Make, fine making it shorter? Make, making it length, shorter, uh, making it punchier, um, giving you... Uh, so currently AP headlines generally tell you most of what you need to know about a story. Making sure that those, those updates uh, are, are part of the headline and, and, and so you know what they are kind of very quickly. Uh, photo selection. Uh, online Photos are gorgeous. They're big, 600 pixels wide. You know, great, fantastic. On the on the cell phone, you need to crop hard. You need to choose uh, bigger subjects in order to make it compelling. Uh, and one thing that that's purely mobile that we've we've been working on is is in the area of push notifications, uh, where we started working with Apple on on uh, on driving traffic back to our properties using using push notifications and. You know, obviously we've been experimenting, you know, how many is too many, how many is too few. We've been bringing down the, the time it takes to get it from uh, an event happening to, to the push notification itself. But um, that's been a huge success and, and, and it's purely mobile content creation. Then, then, then making this content available across all platforms with all these different screen sizes, resolutions, operating systems, is that giving you a big headache? Yes. <laughs> 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 Elaborate on that. <laughs> now, give us an example of where things go wrong. You know what we have to uh, to to to. I think be the aware. biggest the biggest problem I've seen, and and people are doing this really well now. And the iPhone is kind of kind of consolidated people uh, around kind of good design. The thing I've I've seen where people go wrong is they expect one platform to be the same as any other platform. So they develop for, I don't know, Nokia, and then they roll that out. Or they develop for Java, and then they roll that out to BlackBerry and, and Nokia, and so on and so on. Um, it's not like that. You have to take, you have to take, uh, you've got to take the intrinsic aspects of each platform and what they can offer you. For instance, push notification works on, on, yep. on the iPhone. 
BlackBerry just launched but it. Th but that's very interesting because there are a lot of companies around internationally as well who are trying to sell us, all the media companies, this cross-platform mobile solutions. Uh, uh, Stacey, do you have well, any yeah, experiences yeah, with that? Because well, basically what Benjamin is saying, don't do it, develop for every platform you know, a specific... There's another reason to develop across, I mean, to develop it individually for platforms, and that is the users are different. Um, the users, for instance, the Wall Street Journal, when they're planning their mobile reader, which they're about to start charging for, um, the BlackBerry version is very different from the iPhone version, which will be different from an Android version, because the users of those, f of those applications have said, th those devices say, we want different things. The BlackBerry user may want more access to instant headlines, instant news from a variety of sources. Uh, the iPhone user may be looking more for text, for video, for, for longer stories. There's a lot of, for push notifications on each, there's, there's a lot of variations there. And I was struck by how well they managed to find the spot that each device, you know, each device user might most want. Um, it's same thing for CNN. Um, their new, how many of you have tried the new CNN app that launched this week? You actually paid for it, okay. How many of you are willing to pay $2 for an app that gets you that kind of access? Okay. Why haven't you already? Yeah, that's a, that's a majority, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. But, but the new CNN app was, was very specifically designed to make sure that, that you take advantage of the best that CNN can offer without overwhelming people with everything. The funny thing is, like Rafit started to look at it and he goes, why can't you make the website more like the app? I would yeah. use the website more often because, yeah, because the website, the app has all that is the best in one place. Yeah, because that, that's basically the next uh, question. How uh, should your mobile content be related to the web content? And, and if so, how do you achieve that? Is it just branding, look and feel? Or do you want to use the same content just in a, in a different interface? Yeah, I'm just going to jump in on that. You, you do, I think, you know, we used to talk about shovelware derisively, um, the idea that you would just take content from one pl platform and shove it under the other. If that's what you're doing, then, then that is wrong. But if you're using that same content in ways that make sense across different devices and different platforms, then, then you're doing yourselves and your users a favor. Um, I don't want to feel like when I go to the NPR app that I'm just getting a, a half-baked idea of what NPR is. What I like about that app is that I can get so much of it in one place hmm. and that they're making use. And from a financial perspective, the two of you would know better, you have to do that, don't you? I mean, you have to be able to make the most out of each piece of content. Yeah, people get content from anywhere. Um, and if they're going to pay for something, it's going to be functionality at this point until we... Until, right. we, until we socialize them to the idea that content is, is valuable. But that's a very important conclusion. People don't pay for the content, they pay for functionality. So that's on mobile probably even more important than on the web. Yeah. And, on. and we don't need to turn this into a discussion about will people pay for apps, but I think, I think people do. The, the sea is changing. Yeah, people definitely do. I mean, we see it here, we see it everywhere. But, uh, but still, we have, if we're going to cater for all different platforms out there, you, if you look at the mobile phone, in Norway, an average mobile phone lasts for a year and a half. Uh, and all the manufacturers, they produce loads of mobile phones every year on different platforms. Um, should we as broadcasters and journalists, uh, newspapers, take that responsibility? Should we have to spend loads of money on developing for each and every phone? What if that was the case for television? So we would have to make television for Sony, for Samsung, for Philips and so on? Yeah, but to be, to be honest with you, that's becoming reality as well with the, with the connected TV. Yeah. We as NOS, we are developing now different websites for the Philips Net TV, for the Sony Bravia, for the Yahoo widget bar, for the Intel widget bar, for the Samsung uh, connected TV. So that's exactly what is happening on all platforms. And there's a gradient, obviously, somewhere in there is, you know, we only have one visualization for every platform, and then going to your point, we have a visualization per platform, and there's, you know, you have to choose where, you know, your, where your budget goes. Um, but eventually, we're going to have to slide more and more to there being standards in terms of visualization. 
Well, well, the EBU, EBU is working. What take us the question? Yeah. Uh, uh, the EBU is looking at standardising this uh, for a television, as uh, Roland is mentioning, uh, but might be too late because they're already out there with all yep. the different uh, ways of doing it. But I think it should be standardised. We should offer open APIs. We should offer a content of services in a standardised manner, uh, as to, to yeah, as but much extent as possible. Obviously, the big problem on mobile is uh, uh, if you only look at video, there are uh, you know uh, three, four, five different video codecs, and if you are in, in the video business, that's that's really a problem. I mean, we have a whole battery of encoders, uh, you know, producing all these different uh, codecs for different handsets. Uh, it's impossible. And Basically. I will add, we've been focusing a lot here on apps that are designed for specific things, but one of the easiest things that any journalism organization can do is optimize its website for mobile browser use. And if you haven't already done that, and you left here thinking there's only one thing I need to do at my news organization to make us better online and on mobile, I would say optimize for use, for mobile use. And that makes a huge difference to the reader. Who doesn't have a, a mobile optimized website right now? I'm going to bet if you're uh, So everybody who, has. Who, yeah. who doesn't want to admit that they don't have a mobile? <laughs> How many have opt iPhone optimized websites? How many have an iPhone app in the store? Okay. We talked about the content. Uh, uh, user interface is, we said, if people are going to pay at all for mobile apps, uh, it's, it's because of functionality. Uh, if we look at the user interfaces, is, are there new developments in that area? Is, is that something that, that people are focusing on, on uh, uh, substantially? Uh, what is happening in that area? Um, it's a very exciting area because it but, but, it... but I think everybody's doing more or less the same. You see, you know, a bar with some icons, you click on it, you get a photo, you get a story, you click on it, you get the full story. Yeah, That's but it's, all. It, it's the only yeah. way that you can increase the usage of your, of your content and really shine is to, is to spend money on UI. Hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm going to be the first to put my hand up and say we, we, we have a lot of, uh, a, lot of a, a long way to go, but... Um, you know, when you're thinking about it, you know, simplicity, simple, simple, simple. These things are small. Um, yep. You gotta, you gotta have as much white space as possible. You gotta reduce the confusion. Uh, and you know, we're we're just as irresponsible as everybody else and trying to jam as much as we can into those 320 pixels. Um, but you know, there will be there will be kind of a move towards more and more uh, kind of uh, simplicity. No, I, I fully agree with you. We, at, at NOS, for example, we spend a lot of time in developing uh, small icons for the different uh, categories of content. Uh, I just showed you in the beginning that example. It's it's here in the in the top bar. On the left, that's news. The the small ball is sports, weather, uh, video, traffic. You know, if you, that's that's a way of you know reducing the space you use for uh, offering different different types of content. Is is this what you mean, Benjamin? Yeah, but I but I also you know UI is is both uh, design and, and content, right? So so we were talking about design, but there's also you know when you're looking at UI, you have to make sure that the content that's in there is has you got to focus on what's essential for for mobile because that's what what users really want. You know, and, and I think, you know, I, I do like that, the CNN app, but one other thing I've noticed is I keep hitting the wrong buttons inadvertently because there's so many ways to access information from one page. If I swipe in the wrong direction, all of a sudden I'm in a new area. Now, the nice thing about that is I keep discovering new things about the CNN app, but I don't think that's what they intended. Okay, we have a, a question. If you yeah, I was, um, state I'm, your name, please, and what sure, you do. Sure, I'm Katie Joel from AFP. And I'm wondering, I have two questions. It's about traffic. One is specific to the AP app, and then the other is more for the um, panel. One is, on the AP app, what type of traffic do you see going to the local news portion? Yeah, um, this kind of surprised us as well. The, the, the home page or the front page uh, obviously gets the, the lion's share of, of traffic. Uh, it, it's roughly in the 65% range, uh, 60 to 65% range. The next largest category, and, and, and therefore the first user selected category, because it's the first thing they click, is local. Uh, we're seeing well over 20% of all, of all of our traffic goes to local. Okay, and then f as far as audiences moving to mobile, how much of a web audience 
uses the mobile device. So say, you know, you're a newspaper, you have your website. Is it 10% of the audience goes to mobile? Or, you know, what are the, the ratios of people moving from print straight to mobile? Or what are the percentages of folks going across all different platforms or just to one? Well, for NRK on the mobile um, website there, it's around 5%. Uh, compared to the internet side? In the Netherlands, our website is uh, between 10 and 12% of the people uh, uh, traffic on the mobile website. Yeah. But then uh, the applications are separate from that and they attract, uh, especially on the iPhone, uh, uh, a big, much bigger percentage. Yeah. I, I will say that one of the things that makes that a muddier question to answer for, for a site like ours, for instance, we've been offering RSS feeds for more than five years. And a lot of the people who get us via mobile aren't necessarily coming into our mobile site. Yep. Um, they are getting our stuff delivered in, in a variety of ways, but they're accessing it on their, on their BlackBerry. Our news, one of the who's, who's having a mobile RSS reader on his phone installed? One or two people. I think most of the traffic is coming from other sites implementing your RSS feed. Well, it's either that or you're getting it through, you're getting it through email or you're getting it through... Um, a variety of ways. I think one of the biggest, I don't know if any of you get our newsletters, but one of the biggest complaints we had at one point was how hard it was to read on a Blackberry because it would come through in about 30 screens. Um, and, and that's something that we really went in and redesigned so that it would be easier for people to get right to what they need, you know, from, a, from that email delivery. So, you know, when we're talking about all of this, RSS and email on mobile are, are really important ways that people are accessing your yeah. content. Next question. Uh. Good morning. I'm Alicia Stewart with CNN. And I'm curious, in terms of a mobile generation, what might not be able to be defined specifically, one thing we have found um, from the Pew Internet poll and se several other polls this summer was how over-indexed African-American Hispanic users are of mobile, specifically Internet on mobile. So I'm curious, what are the strategies that your companies are using to target that demographic and or what you're hearing in the marketplace in terms of using that specific research to reach those audiences? Benjamin? Um, we already have uh, uh, AP Movil, um, which is the uh, Spanish language version of AP Mobile in the US. Uh, and we're uh, rapidly uh, expanding down to uh, Central and South America. Um, that's, those are our efforts. Stacy, any trends in this that you? You know, I, I, I honestly can't say that I have. I'm not surprised at the over-indexing, um, particularly as people go to use mobile phones instead of landlines as their primary, um, primary device. Uh, but no, I, I honestly can't say. But what I am going to say is I'm going to go look at it. <laughs> so thanks for the suggestion. OK. Thank you. Next. Just, one, just one note on usability, a user interface. That's one of the reasons we're going for a broadcasting technology when it comes to mini TV. Just press turn, turn the device on and it works. And through that um, TV channel, we can put layers on top of it where we can sell in additional services. Press here to watch um, an archived episode on demand, or press here to watch a future episode, or press here to read the news, so you get a news ticker. So we're using that broadcasted channel in order to sell in new uh, services. And it's very easy, very understandable to well, people. Now you mentioned that. Uh, I think you launched the first interactive ad in the world on Norwegian mobile TV. Uh, what was it? How did it work? Well, we did that together with Ericsson uh, three years ago. We, um, it was a client, downloadable client for mobile phones. Uh, it worked via 3G, and in that client you had a choice between three different TV channels and three different radio channels. And you could easily switch between them. Um, in order to download it, you had to tell a little bit of information about yourself, uh, gender, um, age, where you lived, and your interests. So when you're watching TV, Say the two of you are watching the same show on TV, um, but say you're interested in cars, so you get car adverts at the bottom of the screen, and you're interested in travel, so you get travel adverts at the bottom of the screen. And what we saw, we did this, it was a trial, uh, we had a thousand uses, a little over a thousand uses, it lasted throughout a nine month period, um, and we had a click through rate of 13% throughout the period. And we said, wow, that's not so possible. <laughs> uh, but so we asked people, you know, did a survey in the end. So what's going on here? You know, first of all, they said, well, this is great. You know, we do expect adver advertisements on such a service. It's free of charge. So, you know, it's fine that uh, somebody's paying for it. And it's a lot better to get advertisements on something I actually like uh, 
than to get it on diapers and uh, washing up liquids or whatever that I'm not interested in. So people really like that, and um, we um, we had we, we partnered with BBDO who supplied the, the adver uh, adver uh, advertisers, and, and they were like, "Wow, this is crazy." And what we saw after that, um, all, all the big marketing companies, advertising companies in Norway have employ, uh, employed own people working with mobile. Okay. So that, that made a, really made a difference. Yeah. Okay, we have a, a question. Sir. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I'm Momoyo Hamza from the Voice of America. Um, I was just wondering if any of you can share with us any knowledge you have on mobile content access in Africa, where more people have cell phones and other mobile devices than they have computers. Yep. Any of you? <laughs> well, I've lived in Zambia for five years, and I uh, went back to visit my old friends uh, last summer. And uh, um, so I'm more than uh, ever interested in uh, cell phones in Africa. But uh, what we one of the problems is that only uh, 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 most countries don't have data networks up and running. They just have cell networks where you can call and SMS. Uh, only a few countries like South Africa, um, I, th I think Botswana, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and the Northern African countries, and, and two or three in West Africa have actually data networks up and running. So that makes it already a very different different uh, market. What, what you see in Africa, which is extremely interesting, is that uh, people use the SMS technology and, and the, the prepaid possibilities of the mobile phone for all kind of functionality. I mean, they pay each other uh, by now and on some networks with the credits you have on your prepaid card, that kind of stuff. And as, as you probably know, Google is setting up all kind of services for, uh, especially targeted at Africa, uh, with um, uh, prices of um, um, vegetables, fruits, livestock, that kind of thing. So people can ask a question, send an, send an SMS with a question and get a straight, uh, uh, an instant answer. Uh, is is that what you what you mean or yeah? Do you see any uh, eye-opening trend coming up in the next uh, uh, you know short period? Let's say. Well, I, I, in my opinion, you know, uh, um, an emerging market like Africa is can be really interesting and very important because they they will skip the uh, the, the uh, all the problems we had in the the, the previous generation of, of devices and, and web and go straight to the next generation. Look so at look at what Nokia has just announced. Um, they're they're moving away from Series 30, and all of their lower yeah. end phones are all going to be running Series 40, which is data enabled and can run applications. So you'll see huge increases in, in data usage in, in emerging and developing countries. Yeah, I fully agree. And also Nokia is now introducing micropayment solutions that's aiming at Asia and Africa, and I think that can also make a huge difference uh, due to the lack of, of bank branches in, in rural uh, so say areas. I, I do think that the use of the, the microtransactions in Africa is going to teach us all a lot about what people, you know, how people are willing to use information mobile and that's I mean the economist just had a very good article on that it's it's a good uh, it's a good test bed of course it's a little different since it jumped since it did jump you know right over a lot of the issues we have uh, but but I'm eager to see what we're going to learn okay next well, question sir well that that segues pretty well in can you introduce yourself uh, oh I'm sorry I'm, okay. uh, Craig Sandler I own specialty wire services in Boston and Tallahassee covering state government and that segues you know well well into what I wanted to talk about uh, really with the room which is that um, my wire services actually make a good good deal of money servicing a specific kind of mobile generation and they're in mostly their 40s and 50s and 60s and they're lobbyists and they're Blackberry addicts and it was very interesting what happened a couple of years ago when we morphed what we'd been doing online a long time uh, for a long time to the to the mobile devices the they just went nuts and in fact now they're now a lot of my subscribers are really pushing us to do more and more and more um, but actually not so much necessarily with uh, style and web pages and so forth, just the content. We keep it very simple and because they're addicted to their emails and their crackberries, they sit there all day long loving us for pumping out, for pushing uh, email. So I wanted to just really suggest for the room that there's 
Uh, I think that there's a lot of niches already like mine that are willing to pay right now without a lot of, of uh, technological difficulty on the to provider end. But having said that, I, I kind of wanted to pose to you guys how much of that kind of trend you're seeing where even larger you know, media organizations are identi identifying niches, um, asking them, do you want to pay for some of this, particularly when it's breaking and continual? And um, how it's going on the micropayment and just on the on the on the monetizing end of it. We're it's I'm encouraged by the future and by this platform. Okay, Stacy, not to be not to be flip, but in some respects, the amount of people willing to pay isn't of itself a niche. Um, and that is, you, you know, you're already aiming at a smaller group of your users to begin with when you start a pay application, um, when, you, when you add one. So the question is, what will they pay for um, out of that? And I think, yes, a lot of news organizations are looking at ways that they can um, atomize content, that they can take things out of their stream, put them in a format that somebody's willing to pay for because they don't have to read through all the other clutter to get to it. What are you excited about? What, 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 you know, what do you point to to say, here's some people who are taking successful first steps? Well, I wish I could say that there's something like Brash and Young that, that I'm, I'm excited about, but I wasn't think, I, I apologize, I wasn't actually thinking in that direction, but I am excited about seeing mainstream news organizations learn how to be more nimble and more adept. Um, and I think one of the, one of the sort of things I, like for instance about iPhone, is the number of iterations that companies keep, you know, that newsrooms keep doing. Um, where they're willing to put something up, even if on occasion I disagree with the idea of putting something up that isn't quite ready, they're now willing to put it up and change it as they go along. And, and I think that that may not sound very new and exciting to people, but anyone who's worked in a mainstream news organization and seen how long it can take to get something done can get a little excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question, uh, please. Hi, uh, Josh Belsman from uh, MSNBC.com. I'm interested if you could share, uh, you know, perhaps a specific strategy for leveraging um, an immersive, interactive project developed for a desktop platform on mobile platforms. And also, is there a tension happening here between, you know, uh, um, as technology grows and develops on desktops, and, and we become more interested in creating, you know, these, these great whiz-bang interactive experiences, and then this, you know, simultaneous drive to make all our content accessible from any platform anywhere, and how do we reconcile the two? Thank you. Well, you're, you're, the, one in the, you're the one in the organization that has to grapple with this every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so AP doesn't have a, a web property currently, um, or, or doesn't have a web property. Uh, so mobile is really, what, uh, is really what I focus on, uh, and it's really the kind of... Uh, Gunnar, do you have thoughts on it? Yes, yeah, certainly. Anarchia is um, looking at all, all platforms. Anarchia is a public service broadcaster, just like the BBC license funded. Uh, not supposed to make money. Uh, NMTV can make money, but I'm uh, okay. Uh, but it's very important to reach the audiences where they want to be. Um, and instead of saying you have to come to NRK.no, our web portal, we should be where they are, whether it's on Facebook or uh, you name it. Twitter, um, and also on all sorts of devices. We're looking at delivering to um, PlayStations and Xboxes and all the rest of it. So, um, so does that mean dumbing down your content so it's accessible in these places, or do you expand the size of the team creating this so you've got kind of dual track and we're going to develop this for desktop and this for the... Well, a little bit of both. We, we do prefer open AP, uh, APIs and, and, you know, the different uh, platforms tailoring or, or making it available, but we also have people working on, on the most popular uh, platforms, yes. I, I think the apps that are, I mean, the, the, the initiatives that are most successful are the ones that don't dumb down, but they do recognize the use, the, the technology that is being used to access their material. So for instance, don't give somebody a huge video file if they can only watch it, you know, on a slow connection. Um, and I think, you know, that may sound obvious, but at the same time, it's something, I, a mistake I see a lot of the times where people try and shove a lot of information through a very small, you know, funnel end. Um, you know, make it so that the user can choose whatever platform they're on, what they're going to make the most use of, and don't just shove it down them or shove it at them. We just, you know, as an example, we had a lot of time uh, of trouble we have a great interactive department creating in incredible interactives all, uh, every day in Flash. Obviously, the iPhone doesn't support Flash. What do we do? Uh, we had to create a, a video uh, style uh, walkthrough of the 
of the interactive with, uh, with audio and video. So we're creating different types of content for different platforms. But it's the same, you know, it's the same interactive just with a different visualization. We, we, just, we also did some uh, P2P stuff with I, uh, HD, high definition TV series. We made them available through P2P networks. And we got so much positive feedback from especially young people. Some of them saying, wow, this is the first time it felt good to pay the license fee. Uh, you are where I want you to be. It's, you're not only thinking television and traditional radio. You're actually following what's going on. Um, so we have to do that. If we don't, we're going to be dead in a few years if we don't follow what you people, people want and where they want to be. All right, thank you. OK, next question, please. Hi, I'm Lee Byron from Facebook. Hi. Uh, you've talked a lot about the constraints of mobile in terms of the size of the device and the amount of bandwidth that goes to the device. We haven't talked a lot about the benefits of mobile. One thing that I think is really interesting about mobile is that it's inherently location-based. It's location-aware. There's opportunities for serendipity. Can you talk about some experiences or insights or any kind of discussion you may have around this idea of location and serendipity? We tried that a few years ago on, on television. We had a, a very popular discussion program on TV, and we uh, asked for questions via SMS, and we located where they were coming from, and that really added to it. Our, you know, there was a question from the northern part of Norway, and we also did this for, for uh, votes. We asked, should Norway join the EU? And uh, Norway's, well, 52% no, but if you went and looked at Oslo, it was 64% yes. And if you look at this other you know, west coast, you know, it was 59% no, and so on. Yeah. So that really helps us enhance the, this voting experience and to share it, you know, across yeah. the country. No, an example from NOS is that we are integrating, for example, uh, user-generated content in our mobile platform. So ask people to send in videos or photos. And uh, when we have geo-information, of course, we, we use that to present, we can use it to present the content on a map or also verify if, if the, the person is actually there where he's saying he is, you know, and, and uh, get some more information about what is exactly going on on that location. So yes, we, we are very aware of it. Uh, uh, and of course, it's a, it's a revolution in, in mobile, in, in my opinion. I mean, if we see what is happening with, especially also, uh, yeah, it's also augmented reality, which is an incredible, uh, it's a great you know, thing. It's really innovative. And I, I think we should all learn again what we can do with it and how we can adapt to it. It's, yeah. it's really interesting. Uh, so we started an experiment. Uh, we created a product on, uh, on Nokia Apps on Maps. Uh, where we put all of uh, AP photographs, thousands of photographs, uh, onto, a, on, onto a map so you could locate uh, and you could find uh, areas of, of interest and you could search uh, for, for photos that, that you were interested in. Um, it hasn't come to market yet. It was, an, uh, you know, we were showing it off at Nokia World. The, the thing we're struggling with is that this is great, but all of the content management systems we, we know of don't can't support the level of resolution that make it really useful yet. So when something's filed in Washington, D.C., it gets filed to the center point of Washington, D.C., no matter whether it was you know, in the Senate House or in the Smithsonian Museum. Yeah. It, but we are facing exactly the same problem. We did an experiment with all the news articles to try to, to point them on a map. Uh, well, for the Dutch situation, 80% of the articles is pointed on The Hague because it's, uh, it's uh, you know, and the rest is in Hilversum where the television station is based uh, because, you know, a lot of news is simply coming uh, from there. And so you have a problem where you have a, 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 a visualization that's meant to help aid you discover content, but you can't because it's all mapped onto this one yeah. zero, zero, zero uh, for, the, for the city and then it's like this big kind of stack of content. Um, so we have to... Well, the systems have to. Yeah, have what, to what we are looking at now is, is uh, if we can uh, adapt the equipment our reporters are using. So you know, use the information from their the information from their mobile phones where they, where exactly they shot the material they are using in their report. Well, if we have that somehow integrated in the system, we could probably use that to to point. A, a specific report on a very precise location on a map. But there are subtleties yeah. with that too, because you don't want to be giving away the the, right. the, yeah. the 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 source that you just interviewed. You don't necessarily want to pin them down to a specific street. Uh, so, or do you? Well, <laughs> you know, I, from 
first of all, loca I think location is very exciting. Um, there's a lot of, of great potential there as a user. Uh, I find that the sites, that the, the ones that have the ability to find out where I am, I tend to use the local information more. If I have to put my information in, I may not be as likely to tap, tap into their local resources the same way. There is a sort of funny one, though. In NPR's app, when it locates me, it tells me the nearest radio station to me in St. Louis is actually across the river in Illinois. That's because the radio tower, I found out, is actually very close to me, and it's closer than the one that my local station uses. And so I, it, it, it advises me to use a different station than the one that would really be mine. So there's a lot of nuances to location from the user perspective that we still have to figure out. There is one other exciting thing we haven't really talked about, and that's the way these apps or these, the news organizations can use user-generated content now um, in a much more efficient, much easier way. So for instance, the CNN app includes an iReporter management kit. Um, to use online and to upload online. Now, you know, aside from the fact that this means we get a lot more crappy video and crappy pictures, I apologize for the use of the word, but there's no other way to say it until iPhone makes the camera better. Um, it does make it a lot easier for someone to literally snap, shoot, and send. And that is going to overwhelm some newsrooms at some point, but it's also an exciting change. Same with CBS, which doesn't charge for their version. And we have uh, a thing called Sent AP in, in our application, which uh, elicits user user stories. So if something's breaking, they can just send it to us. And we've we've had a couple of really interesting success stories where uh, you know something happens. Uh, we don't take that report and just kind of put it on the wire. We contact the person. We get more color. Uh, we ask them to send photographs if it's appropriate. Um, you know, we just ran a story last uh, like two days ago that came from such a reader submission. Uh, it's in its early stages for us. Yeah, but I, I think for all of us, but it's, it's extremely interesting. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks yeah. a lot. Okay. I just want to make a quick comment about the last one and then ask my own question. I also see great opportunity in hyper-local stuff, not just UGC stuff. So an example, let's say um, Mercury News here um, in San Jose, which I used to work for, I now work at Yahoo. Um, you know, if they want to do hyper-local content, they could find out where the iPhone user is and then deliver the right content for that particular neighborhood where that person lives. Um, but actually, um, I'm uh, Kim Moy and I am the managing editor for the US uh, front page of Yahoo. And I have a question about, um, there's a mention about some innovative advertising on mobile. I'm kind of curious in hearing a little bit more about that and how it might influence content. Because obviously, we want to produce content that makes money <laughs> as well. <laughs> One, one thing I will tell you, if you think innovative is doing a full screen ad where the content should be, try not to think it. Um, it doesn't work. <laughs> the New York Times has, has tried this, and I, while I applaud their efforts at monetizing the, the app, um, it's annoying as I'll get out. And if, it's, if you think it's annoying on a website, on, an, on a phone when you're in a hurry and you're clicking and you want to see something, it's really annoying. And you're just as likely to go to the next thing as you are to click on that. You know, one of the one of the things we're seeing, and I can't say it's particularly innovative, but you are seeing a lot of logo placement as opposed to display ads. So like, again, and I'm, I don't mean to be fixated on the CNN app, but I did spend a couple of days looking at it pretty intensely. Uh, one of the reasons their, their cost is low is because it's a hybrid product, um, which is also ad supported. And the ad support is through logo placement and display ads, um, you know, narrow band display ads that, that disappear when you're looking at certain content. And appear at You're seeing that innovation because the uh, mobile ad market has just kind of bottomed out over the last year. So sponsorships are really the the way forward right now, and and also kind of innovative uh, innovative units. So we're all struggling with how do we integrate this? Uh, how do we integrate these units? What they sh what should they be? Um, and I think the most interesting thing for us is is personalization. This this device already has. Everybody you know, it's got everything you you do. Uh, it's it's got er, it's got where you are. It's got you know all the photos you take. How can we personalize you know based on that content? And, and you know we're only again we're only beginning that that. Mm. There's a fine line there though, because if you overstep that and people feel intruded upon, there that's going to backfire. Sure. I think so. That's uh, sure. something too. And I think people do feel, you know, um, mobile advertising, while it has a lot of promise, especially if you agree to have it, if you opt into the concept, it feels more invasive somehow than other forms of advertising because you're literally, you know, it's literally in your most personal space. 
it's not across the desk from you kind of thing. And I, I don't know if other people feel the same way, but I know that I feel that way unless I'm expecting advertising and I've agreed to have it in exchange for getting my, you know, for getting my information or my, or my entertainment. Yeah, or in exchange for getting your app for free, for example. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, I, I think actually that's one of the most interesting models to me is the idea that you might be able to click and say, as Solanda had, had been doing online for a long time, you know, you can pay not to get all the ads, um, or you can support us with your attention by reading our, you know, seeing our ads. Yep. Or both. Or you both. have ads and you pay. Yeah. And, and that, that's, that's why I was sort of glad to see CNN the do $2. Model. That, that was why the $2 number for CNN's app sort of struck me. If they'd gone for $5 in advertising, I might have been a little miffed. Um, $2 in advertising, I felt like, okay, we're each giving something here. But they don't give you a choice. Yeah. No. Either do we, but... but um, no, none at all. It would be great to offer the user a choice. Do you want to have ads or not? Do you want to have yeah. ads and, and, but, and... But I think that's one AP? of the models we really see working in Europe as well. So give people the, the option to pay for not having ads, and that's a very good model. If you don't want to pay, fine, you get the ads. Is, is AP going to do a model like that? Sorry? Uh, ag again, uh, the, the, uh. the technology platforms are the ones kind of limiting us. So we have a free application, but Apple doesn't allow us to do uh, premium upgrade for, for premium content. Hmm. Um, you know, when it gets to a point where we can uh, rely on the, the technology, Yes, I mean, the models, we already have worked on the models. Uh, it, it makes sense. It's just, uh, how, do we, I, I, how do we get beyond that hurdle? And CNN's done a great job there. Talking about that, I was wondering how you feel about all those walled gardens and, and Apple more or less deciding what we can bring to mobile or not. I mean, in, 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 in Holland especially, we had a lot of problems with applications that were refused because of explicit content, which in, in our standards <laughs> is... Uh, <laughs> you refuse anything for explicit content in Holland? <laughs> I'm having a hard time believing that. Uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, I was very resistant towards iPhone for a lot of reasons. The, the battery life um, drove me crazy. Um, no, but let's talk about this. But, this but, 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 but I want to say the thing that I didn't like the most was the walled garden. I didn't like the idea that iPhone was telling me the certain kinds of information that we like. And we'll also, and this is very funny, yes, this really is an iPhone. It doesn't look like one because it's inside a battery case. Um, a lot of people love how yeah. thin their iPhone is and how no, but, stylish but, but it Stacey, looks. But Stacey, people might use the Windows Mobile handset, but they don't use the internet on it because if you look at the impressions on the ad mob advertisements, uh, it's Apple iPhone with 20% uh, on top. You know, because Windows Mobile who, is somewhere down, 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 down. People who use iPhones are more likely to use web browsers to begin yeah. with, and not all of not all of the Windows Mobile. I think and, you know, I, phones can do the same things that an iPhone can. So yes, I, yeah, I do agree with you. For advertising impressions and for that kind of reach, iPhones reach is deeper. Um, because we spend more time with our iPhones doing that kind of thing, we're trained differently. They've done a beautiful job with that. Talking about handsets, in Europe, the Android uh, is really picking up. Uh, uh, Gunnar, you just shared some uh, metrics with me. Is that the same in the United States? What, what you told me about the HTC. HTC Hero is now selling a lot both in Denmark, Norway, the Nordic countries. And we're seeing the Apple, the iPhone hype is kind of going away, which I find very good because I really hate the walled garden approach they're having. They're now trying to take the role of the mobile network operator. They unlock everything in, everybody in and control everything. But and is the HTC Hero big in the United States? Is Android something you are, you know, Android is, about? Android is picking up, but the first Android handsets in the United States weren't very sexy, um, weren't very appealing to people. I think that the next wave, the HTC version that's coming now, much more exciting, much more interesting, but up against, with the early adapters, a group of people who already went the iPhone route. By the way, notice that no one until now has mentioned the word pre. Do any of you use a pre? So the pre is more usable than an iPhone in a lot of ways. You can multitask with it, you can go back and forth with it, but it doesn't really matter because you're already entrenched in another system and it's not that exciting to you. How is Android? We have only 10 minutes left. I want to go to the gentleman here because he's waiting a long t has been waiting a long time. All right. Well, first of all, the uh, microphone situation is actually rather thematic. Um, <laughs> Notice. About one size not fitting all here. Um, my question has to do with uh, mobile commerce. 
Uh, by the way, Dave LaFontaine from Artesian Media. Uh, in the last year, we had kind of a eye-opening experience when we were working with a client, a uh, movie production company uh, that was trying to uh, advertise and promote a movie, uh, also in connection with the Vatican which for all of you here that are shaking your heads and moaning about dealing with like news organizations that are slow and resistant to change, I invite you to work with a 2,000 year old church. <laughs> anyway, um, what well, we found... In Holland, uh, yes. in Holland we have the, the Bible available on mobile, so... <laughs> so, what, what it, the, the question has to do with uh, standardization uh, with uh, mobile commerce because they're trying to promote a uh, documentary about the life of John Paul II and we found just working with North America, with the United States, Canada, and Mexico, uh, it was a complete nightmare to try to come up with some system to have uh, mobile payments, mobile commerce, and, and, and integrate all of it. Are, are there any solutions that you guys have heard of or seen of that are coming down uh, the, the pike uh, that will help advertisers to be able to run campaigns? Uh, because one of the promises of mobile and the internet is that you can do it across all kinds of boundaries. Well, in Norway, the operators have gone together and using the same, uh, it's called CPA, uh, Content Provider Axis, um, where they do take 30% of the revenue, though. So they have one common system, but it's, uh, the revenue sh uh, share is not uh, very <laughs> lucrative. Uh, so a Amy Webb points out, by the way, about the mobile usage stats, um, that, that, of course, they do vary wildly from country to country. Amy, where are you? Okay. <laughs> Um, and, and that is, I mean, that is important. It does, it does vary. A lot of what we're talking about is it's just not one size fits all. Okay. And we take two more questions. We are running out of time, I think, and then a closing <laughs> question at the forum. Yes, okay. please. Let's try this. Um, Marielle Myers from CBS News. I have a question about the uh, content that you're programming on the Norwegian TV, the mini TVs. Is it, what is the user experience like? Is it, are they just looking at news stories individually? Do you even bother with newscasts anymore? Um, and, and what are you finding that you know they're, they're liking or oh can't even see me. sorry <laughs> and uh, yeah and I guess how are, how are you producing differently for your mini TV than you would for regular you know TV? Go well, right right now we're doing six TV channels. Uh, we're doing 14 radio channels. They're all um, linear. They're existing elsewhere. Uh, we're also looking at of course uh, looped channels made for uh, mobile channels and on demand stuff. So as, as I said, you can just press the button, or you, know, you press the screen in order to watch something else, in order to vote, etc. But currently, it's only live, uh, live TV, because the handsets are not there yet that support 3G. But as yeah. soon as the handsets are there, we, we will link into on-demand content that's uh, already available. Do you, do you see any uh, uptake in, in, in interest on mobile for like raw video or uh, Yeah, what, what we have seen, in, uh, what we are producing a lot of live video, especially also in sports. And maybe I've already the example of the Olympic Games where we offered uh, 13 live channels from Beijing on the mobile. So not forcing people to watch, uh, you know, the one channel with all the highlights, but if you were extremely interested in one specific sport, you could just follow that on your mobile. What was the uptake? Um, it was at the time very good uh, for Dutch standards. We had about uh, 30, 40,000 viewers mm. in, in a small country like Holland. It was substantial. Uh, but we see that with all sports content, but also with breaking news content. We have a linear digital channel, which is also available on the web and on uh, with cable companies that we put linear on uh, the mobile phone and you see really that when something's happening they read something in, in one of the, the, the headlines that something is happening somewhere in the world they check the channel to see if they can get some live coverage just so on, on a note on user feedback people are saying uh, whether they're using this they're while well commuting um, uh, parents are using it because um, the kids shut up. <laughs> but but I have to make one. I have to make one remark on that. It doesn't yet compare to the on-demand content, which is really, really big at the moment. 2009 in Holland is really video on demand on mobile. It's, it's really exploding. Which so. per which percentage of handsets in each country? I mean, g can get um, can actually get TV. Instant TV on online. I mean, on the mobile. Yeah, we have the different systems. Uh, Gunner is really from the the DMB and the DVB-H TV. That's a, a separate system. Uh, in Holland, that's not very big yet, and we are more using the simple 3G uh, uh, um, uh, uh, online uh, uh, live TV. How do you? What's call the it? percentage? 
Yeah. But for well, for the percentage of DMB, it's very low. We just launched in May. But NRK is running 3G, so say it's between 50 and 60 percent of all phones. Uh, so, so yeah, we're doing both, both 3G and DMB. Okay, we're running out of time. Last question and then closing remark. I believe Benjamin said it was difficult and expensive to go mobile. Is there any easy way now or on the horizon to uh, take your website mobile and uh, in the way that blogging has become much easier? I think there is, personally, because in, in Europe there's a lot of expertise and there are a lot of companies now offering really attractive uh, uh, possibilities to translate your websites to uh, mobile, especially have, if you have organized your CMS well. So if everything is XML-based and you have your information uh, XML-based available, they just plug it into a mobile CMS and produce for all different handsets uh, mobile websites, and it's not very expensive. Uh, th that was a bit of a lob question, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, and we work with a company called Verve Wireless, um, and they are, they're experts in, in mobilizing uh, news-specific content and helping, and helping papers monetize it. Um, we've been working with Verve to create uh, uh, templated solutions or custom solutions for iPhone applications. And there are a couple of companies doing this, um, but, but uh, I'd be happy to talk to you or anybody yeah. else afterwards about... In, in Europe, for example, Momac is a very big uh, com uh, company doing that for a lot of news companies. Okay, thank you for the questions. One closing question for you all. Is there one trend in mobile that journalists and the people present at this Congress should be aware of? Very briefly. Start with Gunner. <laughs> Gunner. Well, in, uh, mini TV, of course, in uh, various countries. Uh, 120 million people will get it by one year and through that technology. Um, and we're seeing more and more in, uh, in Norway, uh, journalists are contributing, and I'm uh, sure you see that here as well, via the mobile, when it comes to videos and, and um, photos. Not very new, of course, but it's, uh, we're seeing an uptake of that. Okay, Stacey, what, what is the trend? Microtransactions. Okay. Um, if you haven't already downloaded Bionic Eye for your iPhone, I suggest the, or recommend that you do. It's a great, uh, it, bear with the crashing, but it's a great first shot at augmented reality and, and how we can add this kind of content. It doesn't have any news content yet, but it's only a matter of time. Well, for me, I agree with Benjamin, augmented reality, try the layer. Uh, which is a Dutch product, that's why I'm promoting it. But it's really an, an, an augmented reality browser. It's really excellent working at the moment only on Android devices, but very soon also on iPhone. Well, I want to close it. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your contributions. Thank you for being here. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>